Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on where you are throughout the country today. Uh, my name is Bob Dolan. I'm the Mid-Atlantic Territory Manager for Rainbow Tree Care Scientific Advancements. Uh, I've been spearheading the spot and lanternfly effort for us for the last year and a half or so. Um, really glad you've all been, been able to take the time out of your busy day and, and join us on this webinar. Um, hopefully, you're all able to take away some knowledge and and some sort of a plan uh, for when either spotted lanternfly reaches you or uh, if it's currently in your neck of the woods already. Uh, so quick background on myself. Um, I attended Penn State, uh, studied agricultural science, then moved on to the landscape industry where I worked for one of the nation's leading uh, commercial landscape companies, um, selling millions of dollars in uh, commercial landscape contracts for them over my time there. Um, so dealing with customers and setting expectations um, and growing growing a, a business through renewal rates uh, is, is kind of my forte. Um, so hopefully hopefully you're all able to take away some, some understanding of where my thought process is when I'm approaching these properties. Um, towards the end, we'll give you some examples. Uh, and then we'll also send out our new, newly published uh, Spotted Lanternfly Management Guide, uh, which is super exciting and really informative and really gives you guys a good feel of when and where and how to treat for this pest based on the landscape that you're given. So the takeaways from today, uh, we want to once you to understand why you need to take action, why the lanternfly life cycle is important, what are our management options? And then, like I mentioned, we'll go through some different management scenarios. So why do we need to treat? Uh, we need to treat because of the stress that this bug is putting onto our trees. Um, it, it's not outright killing our ornamental trees just yet. Uh, but it is severely weakening them, weakening them and then making them susceptible to ambrosia beetles and other secondary uh, insects to come in and um, take the tree out the rest of the way. Um, the large amounts of secretion of honeydew uh, is really disgusting and gross. Uh, it's almost as if it's raining if a tree is infested. Uh, in some situations, it, it feels like it's literally raining on you. There's so much being excreted um, and that's just super sticky and is eventually going to turn into the black sooty mold that's going to stain different patio furniture, um, sidewalks, siding, houses, um, and possibly even kill understory plants if they're not able to photosynthesize properly. Uh, and then with that honeydew comes different stinging insects that are attracted to it such as yellow jackets uh, and it's an also a really good opportunity for us to be proactive with customers, take something to them and show them that we have a plan uh, and really be the one taking the initiative uh, for the client rather than the client having to be the one calling us and asking, hey, what do I do? Uh, um, it's an opportunity for us to show our expertise and, and put our best foot forward and, and show them we, we have a plan for them. So the spotted lanternfly is not actually a fly or a moth, um, but it's actually a plant hopper. Um, the big key here is the piercing sucking mouth part that it uses to tap into the phloem of the trees uh, and, and plants that it's feeding on. So it's a super lazy feeder. Basically, it just takes a straw, taps it into the tree like a keg, a keg of beer, and the internal pressure from the plants are going to force the sap into the mouth of the lanternfly and then excretes it, as I mentioned, as honeydew. Um, and these plants will stay on these trees until that internal pressure has been relieved enough that basically they want to move on because they're being too lazy to suck it out themselves. So the life cycle uh, is important. It determines where we're going to find the pest during different times of the season. As it develops, it prefers different plants. Um, so we really want to use our growing degree days as a guideline for spotted lanternfly development and to determine uh, where and when the treatment should be targeted. So in like October through June, 
Uh, this one we're going to see our egg masses, and then we'll see a hatch in the May to June uh, time frame, uh, growing degree days between 240 and 1174. Uh, the second instar we'll see in the Ju Ju June and July time frame, uh, growing degree days between 615 and 1586. Uh, the third instar we'll see again in probably closer to July, but late June as well in this in the case this year as well, uh, where we'll see them between 1020 and 1837. And then we'll finally see the ladybug looking like instar uh, later in July, early August. And then um, I'm pretty sure that we, we've seen them all pretty much molt into the adults by the time September rolls around. Uh, but that fourth instar we'll see around 1300 growing degree three day mark and 2200. Um, and then the adults will have alive and around and flying and pestering us um, from July, August timeframe all the way through December in some cases. Uh, we've seen them laying eggs and feeding still as late as December, um, typically on maples uh, in that circumstance. <clears throat> and then they'll do their egg laying from September through December. So our, uh, the, the lanternfly is an opportunistic feeder and in, it attacks just about any plant species available. Um, it does have certain species that it prefers to feed on if they're present, um, Atlantis being that number one that everyone is focusing on, or tree of heaven. As spotted lanternfly goes through its various stages in their lives, uh, their, their feeding habits tend to change. So, for example, in the first three instars, they're, they're younger, they're not as developed, um, their mouth part isn't as strong and developed to pierce through the bark of a mature tree. So, we oftentimes see them feeding on the leaves and stems of uh, herbaceous plants like roses, grapes, uh, weeds in the turf. Uh, sumac, but we do still as well. Um, so we're going to look for these on the, on the, the lower, lower, uh, understory plants more often than not. Um, a lot of times they'll be on the back side of the leaves. They're going to be super quick, um, and, and run from you as soon as you try to approach them with your hand. Um, they are lightning fast. Um, and then our fourth instar, we see them feed on the leaves and stems. So they'll start to move more towards the woody plants. We've really seen the fourth instar, for some reason, really tend to congregate uh, on black walnut, and then it'll eventually move to the tree of heaven as it moves into the adult stage. Um, still doing some research there to see if there's some sort of correlation uh, between the, the development and life cycle and its need to move towards the Atlantis tree. Um, but yeah, the fourth instar, we'll see them on tree of heaven, walnut specifically, um, some birch and willows. And then the adults is really where we're going to see the mass amounts of honeydew come from. They're the ones tapping into the phloem of the larger trees. Um, we found them on over 70 tree species and feeding as late as December. Um, again, on tree of heaven, walnut, birch, silver maple, red maple, um, the adults tend to really move to to anything that they can really get their, their mouth part into. So the first three instars, we will look at um, the different plants that are susceptible. Um, like I mentioned, roses, grapes, sweet sumac, we'll see that um, from the May time frame, from egg hatch to early July. We will see different instars at different time frames too, so they're not all going to molt and change into the same life phase at the same time. We can have third instars on the same tree as adults. Um, it's not uncommon to see that. There's our rose and grape vines um, that they love so much. Our fourth instar. We'll see them, again, you can kind of see that in the pictures here, they will feed on the stems and, and move more towards the harder tissue as they get more mature uh, and feed on the branching and 
and whatnot of Tree of Heaven and walnuts. Um, and we'll see that in the July through September timeframe. The adult phase, this is where the damage is being done again. Uh, woody plants that they're most commonly gonna be found on, where we'll see them on walnut, birch, willow, tree of heaven, silver and red maple. And this year, uh, we've noticed a big trend towards uh, all varieties of elm trees um, being really, really attacked. And then even reports of ash trees now being fed on um, with them. So good news for the ash trees there. They have to fight with the emerald ash borer and now the lanternfly as well. Take a look at all the management tools we have in our toolbox to battle the lanternfly. Um, we have the tree removal, um, which is always our least desirable option. We would love to keep every tree we can, um, unless it's an invasive like uh, the Atlantis or Tree of Heaven. Uh, we have egg scraping, which can be used as a great like community initiative and awareness kind of plan. Um, but to, to get any sort of real control using egg scraping, we're just not gonna see that. Um, we can ban trees. Uh, that's going to work for our earlier instars. Um, I have a quick story on that when we get to it uh, from about two weeks ago um, in the tree bands. Uh, we can do foliar sprays, which definitely work. It's a super easy pest to kill pretty much any insecticide uh, other than like basic water is going to kill it. Um, it's just a, we're, we're looking for residuals so we don't have to spray um, constantly and we're not spraying huge gigantic trees. Um, and then we have our systemic treatments and we have a, a variety of them available to us. So the tree removal, remove the tree of heaven. Um, it's definitely their most preferred host, uh, but when we do remove it, we have to make sure that we treat with an herbicide, um, triclopyr specifically to prevent re-sprouting. Um, I had met with a nursery grower uh, last week who was telling me he removed all of the Alanthus um, in the around their peak dormancy and did not treat with herbicide. And he mentioned that he has had little to zero re-sprouting. Um, so if you are, are not a fan of herbicide and would like more information on how to properly remove the tree of heaven um, with, to prevent re-sprouting without using herbicide, I'd be more than happy to connect you with Chris um, and he can give you more detail on how he was able to do it. Uh, we can spray it on, we can paint it on, we can apply it multi multiple multitude of ways. Uh, egg scraping, again, it's it's great for like a community initiative if you're in like a homeowners association and um, you know everyone goes out one night and scrapes the visible egg masses they can see off the trees in the community. Um, it's great for groups like Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts um, to get educated on the pest, number one. And then two, you know, every egg mass we take it is removing 30 to 50 lanternfly from the next season. So it will help a little bit, um, but the lanternfly also lay their, their eggs in the, high in the canopy as well. So to expect full remediation using egg scraping is just unrealistic. Um, there was a study done where um, a company attempted to scrape all the visible egg masses they could see. They then fell the tree and analyzed the tree for more egg masses and it turned out that they had only scraped about 10% of the egg masses and they thought they had done a pretty darn good job. Um, so it's really hard to do and in that point you would have to put someone up in either a crane or a bucket truck um, and at that point, or send a climber up, and at that point, it's just a little too costly um, and dangerous for for our other compared to our other options. Here's a picture where again they're pretty high up in the tree. You can't expect someone to be uh, scraping those eggs from the ground. The sticky bands they're great for controlling nymphs. Um, they're great to show that the public that hey we're we're doing something here we're trying to come up with a plan we're we're doing our part. Um, like I mentioned, the nymphs are really mobile. Um, they're really fast. Um, they'll walk up and down the tree. 
um, and that's when they're going to get and fall out of the tree, and then that's when they're going to get stuck on the sticky band. Um, after the emergence of the fourth instar, I would really think about going in a different direction from a sticky band. Um, I was out on our property doing a systemic treatment with a client, and they had used sticky bands, but the fourth instar and adults were both pretty easily able to kind of just jump from the sticky band uh, and get away. So it it showed its effectiveness on the smaller ones, but as they matured, less and less. Um, and the downside is that I have found squirrel tails, um, birds, other undesirable insects that can get caught in the traps. Um, if we're not using different things like cages and different bug barriers uh, to prevent uh, birds and different things like that getting stuck in these sticky bands as well. So what are our tools for the timing of year? Um, January through uh, April, more or less, we can scrape eggs, we can do that part um, until the, the eggs hatch. And then in around April through June, we can target these uh, younger instars using our, our cover sprays like bifenthrin, um, carbaryl, um, and many others, um, conserve or spinosad if you're a little more on the uh, uh, eco-friendly kind of side of things. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. We will tree band as well at the same time that we will uh, use those cover sprays. So um, we do have multiple options for the younger younger instars. Um, the fourth instar we can still hit with a cover spray, but that's really when we're going to start to look into um, our trunk and limb sprays and just our systemic options um, because we know that the adults are coming right around the corner. Uh, and the, we, the reason why we want to wait until we see the fourth instar and adults emerging is our systemic options typically give us three to four months of control. So we want to wait until the very end of the, the early instars so that our treatment efficacy lasts um, all the way through the remainder of the season. So our treatment options, we have Transtec, which is 70% Dinotefuron. Um, we can either use that as a soil injection uh, or a drench, and we now also have a uh, Transtech infusible, so a trunk injection option is now available for that as well. Um, the great part about Transtech is the way that it, the timing works in it um, with the systemic lower bark spray as well, um, which is my preferred favorite method. It's the fastest, great efficacy the lowest amount of damage to the tree, um, very minimal exposure to uh, the applicator, um, and you can get roughly 20 to 25 trees done in an hour if they're all on the same property using the bark spray method. Um, but like I was saying, the, the great thing about Transtech is the timing. It gets into the tree super quick, and we can wait until after the pollinating season is kind of wrapped up so we don't have to worry about bees or other pollinators with it because um, it only takes like four to seven days to get uh, translocated throughout the tree. Uh, and then fortunately, when the leaves all fall off um, come winter time, uh, it also leaves the plant at that time as well. So we're not gonna get carryover into the following spring. So again, we don't have to worry about pollinating uh, pollinator issues. Um, Zytec 10% is a midacloprid. Um, that would be a tree injection method. Um, and that the rates on that all depend on the DBH of the tree. Um, we can do that in the springtime um, and late summer uh, to try to get it into the tree in time for the adults to come feed. Uh, the only downside to the tree injection with the Zytec 10% is that we're going to be drilling into a tree annually if that's the, the method we prefer to go. So that is one downside. Um, I often get a lot of questions about uh, imidacloprid or Zytec uh, as a soil application. And what we found is really inconclusive research on it. Um, 
So we think that it has to do with the amount of active ingredient that we're actually getting into the, into the uh, tree. Um, we don't think it's at a high enough rate. And with the EPA concerns around imidacloprid and the high, heightened awareness around it, um, there's just real no way that we would ever get approval to increase the rates for imidacloprid soil, soil treatments, um, unfortunately. Uh, and then we have Bifen XTS, which is a bifenthrin spray. Um, and basically, we're going to spray the trunk and main limbs uh, as a cover spray. Uh, and we're getting pretty good residuals with this, 14 to 21 days with it. So if you have to get a, a late season knockdown or you're just overwhelmed with a population on a property, this is a great way to to kill a ton of insects really quickly. Um, and then you could come in and do a systemic treatment after just to help knock down the population for the client. Um, Transtag, uh, the Dynatef around 70%. 70%. Um, we do have a 24C special needs label for it. So that allows us to spray uh, three times the pounds per acre. Um, this has really come in handy in the uh, like forestry kind of setting where um, we're dealing with tons of Atlantis trees in a small area uh, it allows us to expand that that pound per acre limit um, the Zytec as soil applied as I mentioned it was getting um, inconsistent control and then again we're also have pounds per acre limitations there um, and the Zytec 10% great tool for when we do run out of um, pounds per acreage that we're allowed to spray of the Transtech. It gives us a, a great tool to kind of offset that because we don't have to worry about pounds per acre when doing trunk injections. But again, it's labor intensive. It's going to be a higher cost and we're, we're wounding the tree. Um, by Fenthrin, low cost, best efficacy of a foliar sprays out of all of the ones we've tested. Um, it's a great solution for controlling the, the early instars on the understory plants, such as roses. Um, I actually applied it at my parents' house um, and my dad's still finding them dead all over the place, he says. Um, and again, the downside with that is it's only like a 21, 20, 14 to 21 day residual compared to Transtech, which is gonna be four months at the high rate. So our management strategy, uh, we're going to do foliar sprays to contact kill uh, the first through first through fourth instar um, while they're feeding on the foliage, um, and we can also use them as a quick kill for the kill of adults later in the season. Um, for example, I was in the Quaker Town, Pennsylvania area, um, probably two months ago, meeting with a, a, a distributor in that area and. He mentioned that the community, because they were so infested, people couldn't even walk out of the grocery store without having to shake their, their grocery bags off before getting in their car, because they would just be swarmed, um, that the, the town was just enraged that they had to do something. So they went and did a quick cover spray um, to knock down some of the population. Uh, and then we have our systemic bark spray for the longer term residual. It's gonna be, again, four to seven days for, for control. Um, it's our fastest application method and it gives us a pretty long residual. So when we're managing for this pest, there's a lot of different things to consider. Um, the client tolerance, are they, do they have a, a high tolerance where they're just like, yeah, make sure my trees don't die or do they have a very low tolerance where they don't want to see a drop of honeydew or a single lanternfly on their property um, or anywhere in between that. Um, sooty mold we have to consider, um, so where these trees and plants are located and what might be underneath or around them that could be damaged. Uh, the swarming wasp, and then of course the always challenge is, is the budget of the client. Um, and then we need to take in consideration our treatment option, so timing of the year, what plant materials on site, what restrictions we may have, whether it's a client who it just does not want pesticides or doesn't want anything sprayed, only wants it systemically treated. Um, so all those different restrictions. And then setting the expectation. Um, 
basically making sure that they understand that, hey, we're not putting up a force field or a bubble around your house. These treatments require the pests to land on and feed on plant material in order to die. So you're still gonna see them on your property, um, but when they do feed, they will die. Uh, and then the client expectations. So what's important to them? What are valuable plants to them? What areas are important? Pools, deck, patio areas, fire pits, um, swings for children. Um, is tree health important to the client? Um, where do they park their cars and sidewalks? Um, don't wanna be parking you know, super expensive, nice car underneath the tree that's gonna be raining honeydew on it for days and days. Um, and then playground areas where kids are gonna congregate. Again, we don't wanna be attracting um, any stinging ex insects there. So we'll take a quick look at an example of a residential property. Um, here the concerns were sooty mold, swarming insects and damage to the plants. Um, they had a putting green on the property. They also had a vegetable garden um, and a wooded area that had some Alanthus trees um, kind of surrounding the property. And they wanted uh, really no inconvenience to using the pool or the patio area um, and the putting green. So we had valuable landscapes, the patio area, pool, putting green garden. Um, we used uh, Transtech bark sprays and removed um, most of the Alanthus around the property. Um, we did leave like four of them, I believe, on this property, spread out pretty even to kind of use as trap trees. Um, and those trees that were left were all treated systemically using Transtech at the high rate. Uh, we also did a transtech bark spray on all the maple trees that were planted around the property. Um, that's all they had that were more of the target trees outside of the Atlantis on this property. Uh, and then the valuable landscape plants out front, we did uh, the bifen foliar sprays. Uh, we did them early in uh, the spring and late or late spring, early summer. Um, and then we're considering it as an option to go back later in the September, October timeframe, check and see if we need to do anything else there as far as the bifriend foliar spray goes. And then uh, another question we always get is around gardens and fruit trees and fruit crops. Um, Carbaryl is what we decided to use in this instance. Um, they do have to spray every seven to 10 days around this garden, um, but it is our, our best option for, for food, uh, for plants that people want to consume the fruit and uh, food off of. Here's a simple real retail location in King of Prussia, PA that we looked at um, that had pretty decent lanternfly infestation. infestation. Um, the concerns were the sooty mold, the umbrellas on the outside and their patio area, um, the sidewalks, and then the swarming insects of people eating outside. Um, getting into the entrance, actually, believe it or not, was a common problem there. Um, and then just people walking from their cars to the, the main entrance were getting swarmed. Um, their expectation was they didn't want spotted lanternfly or mold on the property at all. Um, so again, we, we transect bark sprayed and removed the, the lanternfly target trees that were um, surrounding the property. Um, obviously, we couldn't remove ones that were like in islands and, and more high profile areas. So those were the ones we decided to spray uh, using the bark spray. Uh, here was a Class A office park we visited with a large landscape client. Um, the concerns were tenant complaints, um, walking from their car in and out of the building. Um, the tenants that often visited the smokers, designated smokers area were complaining. Um, and then they were finding dead insects all throughout the lobby as well. Um, so the expectation was no sooty mold on the sidewalks. Um, we wanted to prevent all the honeydew from getting on the tenants' cars and really reduce the, the number of lanternfly that are being seen on the property. 
So again, we, we bark sprayed and removed the Atlantis trees. Um, we did leave two trap trees, one in each corner of the property. Um, and that actually has proven to be very successful on this property as far as reducing the counts that we're seeing around the building. Um, they are tending to congregate closer to the Atlantis trees and they'll move slowly away from it. Um, this, this property was a little bit different than others I've seen. Um, they did tend to creep probably about 100 yards away from the Atlantis tree, but then after that, the, the population was really, really reduced um, elsewhere. Uh, early in the season, we tree banded and transect bark sprayed close to the building. Um, we used the Bifan XTS to spray the roses um, that were surrounding the building and used out by the street sign that was also brand new. Um, we did the tree banding just to kind of show the tenants that, hey, we're, we're doing something here. We're not just ignoring your complaints that, hey, we are aware of it and we're taking the steps properly, proper steps to, to help take care of it for you. Uh, I would also suggest, um, again, the bark spray for target trees that are close to the building. Um, I would really recommend kind of spraying or treating anything within 10 feet of the perimeter of the building to prevent um, those lanternfly from getting into the lobbies and doorways and windows. Uh, that really seemed to make a difference with this property. Um, and it's also something else to consider if we're killing all these lanternflies, it's a great idea to propose um, the cleaning up of the dead adults that are going to be throughout the property. Um, a lot of times they'll almost mimic a mulch ring that uh, once they all die, they'll, they'll drop to the base of the tree and, and kind of cover up the mulch. And after a while, the rotting carcasses can get a little stinky, not to be too gross. Okay, I want to open it up to everybody and see what questions you might have. Um, if it's on a life cycle, treatment plans, treatment options, rates, um, fire away. So we had a couple questions here. Uh, the first is, what is GDD mean? Um, that stands for growing degree days. Next question is, can a homeowner have a reasonable expectation that the spotted lanternfly will be gone with treatments after X amount of years or is this just the new normal? Uh, so unfortunately, this is probably going to just be the new normal. Um, we have seen in where the, the epicenter was in Berks County, there are reports that they're saying that the population has decreased and isn't as bad as when it first started, um, but they are still there. So there hasn't been any area um, that 
has been eradicated yet um, where it's been found, um, unfortunately. Um, so ex someone asked to explain growing degree days. Growing degree days is the scientific way we track um, the development of pests and the way um, plants life cycles operate. So whether it's um, the timing of when something blooms, when something um, is going to change from one point in our life cycle to the next, it's just a, a way we track it using um, a formula based on temperatures. So any local insect or pest that eats these. The only thing that we found that really eats these um, are praying mantis, um, but there aren't enough of them in the world to, to consume these amount of lanternflies. Um, we've also seen chickens eat them, but then after the chickens eat them, they tend to grow up. So um, other than that, there's nothing really out there that's been consuming them. So the next question is, I was under the impression that these pests often move from tree to tree regularly. Wouldn't this make treatment difficult? Uh, yes, that is what the hardest challenge is with this. Um, but we do know that they have preferred hosts. So that's when we're treating the properties. We want to target those preferred host trees, um, really concentrating on Atlantis, um, walnut, uh, birch, maples, uh, elms and now even ash um, and we can we'll send out a guide that has all these preferred hosts um, listed out based on the life cycle are the adults in this photo actively feeding or at rest so right now they are feeding on an Atlantis tree all of them What is the rates for Bifan XTS above 12 inches from a slide you showed earlier? Uh, the rate for Bifan, I will have to look up and I can get back on that. Peters, can you make a note of that to follow up with Deborah? Do you have a recommendation how to get rid of the sooty black mold? on plants. Um, the best suggestion I was given, believe it or not, was actually using horticultural oil. Um, and that was from a professor at Washington State who um, was at a spider lanternfly symposium um, back in February, I believe it was, um, with me. And he said that he's had success using horticultural oil. I, I personally haven't. Um, and again, it's hard to get it off the plants, but for sidewalks, I would recommend pressure washing um, and it still may not all the way come up. Where did the lanternfly come from? They came from Asia. Um, they came from China, Vietnam, and I forget the last country off the top of my head, India. Has this insect been found in California? No, it has not been found in California yet. So far, we have have reports of findings in Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, New York, Massachusetts, and Connecticut. But in Connecticut, I believe they were dead, dead adults. Um, and I believe that's it for now. When using a midocloprid basal bark method for woolly adelgid on hemlock, we're expecting to get multiple years of control. Why not with spotted lanternfly? Uh, I personally have not heard of multiple years of control on the woolly adelgid. I'd have to double check on that. Um, but with the lanternfly, because they require so much active ingredient um, to kill them, 
that's that's why um, it's kind of why we're not seeing it work with the uh, soil application after a certain amount of time we just lose that and lose the enough of um, active ingredient that's that's going to be to provide efficacy okay uh, that's all the questions I had that came in now are there any other questions Thank you, Bill. Thanks for joining. Um, real quick, too, before I let you guys all go, um, in addition to the management guide, I didn't mention that we also come out and do hands-on field training. Um, if you need technical support with it, um, feel free to give us a call on our technical support line. Um, and, and again, we're all of our territory managers would be more than happy to, to come out and help you, you and your, your companies one on one um, get prepared for this this pest. Um, depending on where you are in the country, it may be a different person you're dealing with besides myself. Okay, it looks like that's all the questions for now. Um, I appreciate all your time. Uh, good luck with the rest of your day and good luck with the, the your, have a good Friday tomorrow and then have a good weekend. Uh, hopefully you join us for more webinars in the future. Thank you, have a good one.